Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers as well, and everybody who is here, because uh, I think it's a great opportunity for me to talk and a pleasure to give you a presentation on, and there's the first mistake in my, in my presentation. I put it in there by myself. So this is the pointer, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, because it should read how automation changes the way, oh, it does, okay. But in the program, I think it's changed because the process of uh, automation in biotechnology is, is far from being complete. And especially if you compare the, the, the degree of automation that, is, uh, th that we experience these days in biotechnology and compare this uh, with other industry, like the automotive industry, you know, we are far away from the degree of automation that is um, that is state of the art in these uh, in these um, in these industries. So I would like to um, give you uh, two examples and different concepts of automation, um, and then uh, start uh, with uh, something new um, as a, uh, as a third example and give you also um, a brief introduction in a project that uh, was finished at the University of Bielefeld already eight years ago um, with, uh, with a totally different concept of the automation that is now on the market. So, um, but I would like to, to highlight the goals first. Of course, we need to eliminate manual, um, manual sample handling to gain precision and accuracy. And that's uh, one of uh, the main goals, but also to collect data more frequently and allow for more parallel experiments. And there are uh, very, very good solutions out there on the market already. Um, to uh, highlight one of those, um, uh, I have here two examples, the cell counting. Um, cell counting, because that has something to do with my history. Um, I hope that uh, I know a lot about cell counting. Um, I was one of the inventors of the CDEX system, which is uh, uh, still on the market, uh, sold by Roche. Um, and there we followed a very, very um, strict line to automate the manual process. And I think that's always a good idea if there are manual processes established for a lot of years uh, to see you know, what is the good thing, what are the benefits, the advantages of the manual process, and try to automate this. Of course, cell concentration and viability is a very important parameter, as you see, because we need this for, for example, to calculate specific production rates to see you know, how productive um, uh, a pilot plant or a production plant is, and also uh, for um, documentation um, and to show the, uh, the authorities that the process um, is in line with you know, what it's classified. But in the end of the day, cell concentration measurement is the main reason to be in the lab at the weekend. And that's something where other industries are far ahead um, because cell counts, cell concentrations, cell samples cannot be conserved over the weekend. They have to be drawn on Sundays, Saturdays, and then you have to, to count this. How do we do this? Usually with the tripe and blue dye exclusion method, and that is still the standard. Um, those who uh, have experiences in manual cell counting know that it's an important task, but also very cumbersome and very, very, it, people don't like it uh, because they, they know they can make many mistakes. Um, and uh, it, but it's a very important process parameter they are um, they are dealing with and they are producing here. So you, we have this manual chamber, and then you get images like this. This is an image of a, um, that I copied from a brochure, a very nice image where you clearly see the viable cells, the dead cells, which are stained with tripe and blue. But the re, you know the the reality looks different. And there it is, you know, which of those objects is really dead? This may be a dead cell because it's stained and it's darker than the bright, shining white ones. But there, is, there are also objects in between, like these ones. Um, and it's not a matter of doing something, doing something wrong. It's simply that people, individual people, have different biases in, in, in counting what is still alive and what is dead. Somebody may say this, is, this cell is dead because there's already tripe and blue in there. The other, 
uh, lab member may say, well, it's still alive because the cell is still able to get some of the dye out. And that's why if we have uh, different operators counting the same, and that's important, the same sample again and again, like here we have four samples that are the same and we made them count ten samples without knowing which ones are the same. And here you see the devi deviations between the results. Even here there's something totally wrong, probably with a dilution, with a manual sample procedure. But this is well known in the industry dealing with mammalian cell culture. And it's accepted that the variations are about 15 plus minus 15 to 20 percent with manual cell counts. And that's why, uh, in the end of the day, the automation became so important. And there are now different analyzers. And this is only a small, you know, a small um, uh, example of, how, of, of systems that are out on the market. And I apologize for everybody who is not on that slide, but uh, is exhibiting here. Um, so these are the, the cell counters that automate the whole process. You just put the sample in, the sample gets stained with stripe and blue, transferred into a newborn chamber, a flow-through chamber, an image is taken, and then the image is analyzed automatically. Those here on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, they, um, there you have to still stain manually, but you get the images and, of course, the image recognition results. And that's important. Here you can uh, verify the results, red, uh, red dots are dead cells and the, the green circles are viable cells. And so there you can see whether the system works correctly or not. But what is even more important, you want to get um, the variances out of your daily work. And if you see here a culture that is monitored, a simple batch culture monitored by five different people, they get five different results. But also, that's nothing new. Important is that you have a way as a user to, let's say, tweak the system in a way that you that this system um, that this system represents more or less the average of what you would get with manual users and uh, with 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 multiple users and manual cell counts. Okay, if you if you are, and that's true for for all the automation we are dealing with. If you try to implement and bring a new concept, a new automation, a new analyzer to the market, you have to continue with the old results that have been um, that have been generated manually. So an analyzer that would give you constantly 30 percent higher viable cell counts that wouldn't be the best thing to do, because then the companies would get in problems with the, with the um, authorities like the FDA. Uh, so you have to be able to get this manual bias of distinguishing between viable and dead cells. You have to build this into the machine. And then keep it as it is, and the machine will count on Mondays the same cells and the same viabilities than on Fridays, even after a party. So you gain precision and accuracy with this type of automation. And this type of automation is only one process. It's only one task, one dedicated task. And this machine can, nothing, can do nothing more than cell count and viabilities. A different concept um, is to look at the, at the nutrients and the, the number of different analyzers we use. Uh, for example, for amino acids, we can use HPLC. For antibody concentration measurement, we may use ELISA assays. Or glucose lactate, we may determine with membrane-based enzymatic um, assays, and so on. Also, this is only, these are only four examples. The idea of automation is not only to automate those machines that are able to perform in, with your special application, one task, which would mean here HPLC and amino acids. HPLC is not so good in uh, monitoring glucose lactate or small molecules, but the HPLC system itself may be highly automated. But you need manual sample preparation. The next idea would be to see if there is one concept, one methodology that is able to measure all of those analytes. And that is spectroscopy. 
And if you then put a pipetting device next to or into um, a spectrometer, you are able to monitor a lot of different analytes, like this little instrument here, which is uh, originally being used in uh, human diagnostics, because human diagnostics is also way more automated than biotechnology. And there we modified, slightly modified the instrument, and of course we developed other assays for amino acids, products, glucose, lactate, whatever. Ions like copper, copper is very, uh, very popular these days. Uh, we wondered why, but then I saw a publication that copper, and that was late last year, that copper may affect glycosylation patterns in uh, highly glycosylated uh, molecules. So for that reason, it may be um, a good thing to, to measure copper as well. So this analyzer is now able to measure up to 20 different analytes without any sample preparation except centrifugation. The next thing is that we want to take care about how the sample comes to the analyzer. And also there are different um, concepts out there. One of them is to, um, to pump samples from a process, like here. That's in the university, our 30-liter bioreactor, stainless steel bioreactor, with a special valve through some preparation stations to the analyzers. Here's a cell counter. That's for the analyte measurement. Um, but as you can see, there's an, a lot of technology necessary, a lot of hardware necessary, and that's expensive. And you dedicate one or two or three or even more analyzers to one process, which doesn't make it really cheaper. So it's um, uh, really um, something that you have to think about. Of course, you may be able to hook up two, three, or even four bioreactors to such a concept, but if you are dealing with different cell lines, different products, you really have to take care about cross-contamination. Then this is the, the same uh, product only for lab bioreactors. And here I think you see you know, how much technology is necessary to sample a bioreactor and to bring it to the different analytic devices. What you get out of it is very, very impressive because that's a run in the 30-liter stainless steel bioreactor we did at the university. Um, you know, there are sometimes uh, problems um, for whatever reason with the, with the technology or with the, with the handling of the system. But here you see the cells growing, you see the viability, and everything looks nice. And you also get the data from the nutrients. Um, here, this is um, yeah, due to a mistake that we did. The analyzer uses disposable cuvettes, and of course, uh, on Friday afternoon, uh, we filled up the, uh, the box with the cuvettes, but we forgot to empty the waste container because the cuvettes have to go somewhere. And then, of course, the, the machine counts the cuvettes being used and then stops the process, and, um, yeah, and then you can see something like this. So that's also uh, not really optimal. Um, and, and, and as well, those concepts consume a lot of sample volume. Um, you know, if you have a two-liter bioreactor and you sample like 15 or 20 milliliters per sample and want to get samples out six or eight times a day, that's 160 milliliters per day. So you really have to take care that your bioreactor after one, one and a half week is not empty. Uh, so it, it's not optimal, it's expensive, high maintenance demand, you have to think about everything that is necessary there, and the systems occupy a lot of lab space. Um, another uh, example is a new method, which some of you may not know that uh, this technology is just entering the market. I saw the first two devices um, at ESAC meeting in, I guess it is May, late May in Spain, um, and we have one of those systems in our lab. Uh, it uses uh, holography to monitor cells, and that's very, very interesting because you can create a hologram in principle very easily. You have uh, to establish or to, to use a laser beam, coherent light, illuminate the object. Um, it, you can also go through the object here and have a reference beam, and uh, the interference pattern is being monitored with a CCD camera. The interference pattern looks like this. This is a little toy car, as you can see clearly. 
Okay, you can see nothing because you transform the um, the place information into wave information, and that's that's the phase difference of the object that the object causes in the laser beam. And to reconstruct the image, you have to use a laser beam with the same wavelength, illuminate the hologram, and then you can view from a certain angle and see something like a, th a three-dimensional object. Um, in this instrument here, it is very crucial to, to place the mirrors uh, according to the object in the right position. Um, this technology has been modified by the companies that use these technologies, and in principle, the object is no longer here inside this uh, um, this, this, this array of different mirrors. It is set in front of the mirror. That creates um, another problem that you have to use um, calculation power to calculate the real um, hologram. But that's possible now. Um, the name is differential digital holography and it works not only with coherent light, but you can use LEDs, which is much more comfortable, and the positioning of the mirrors is less critical, so, so that you can can uh, um, screen uh, tea flasks or roller bottles, whatever. What do you get? This is the hologram that's been calculated. You and the the face information that's very important. You are monitoring not the image but the face information. And what you can do is you can then from this hologram. And just want to remind you that this is the hologram you're getting also from cells. It looks very, very similar. Uh, there you can calculate the uh, standard white light intensity image. You can calculate phase contrast images. And you can calculate something that is very convenient for image recognition processes. And then you can count the cells um, without using any dye. Because the principle is the same, and that's very important, because there is not only tripe and blue measurement, there are also other technologies out there, like the Coulter counter principle, like uh, um, electromagnetic uh, or dielectric sp uh, spectroscopy, um, or turbidity. Uh, that's, but they are not able to match the manual results and don't give the right viability information. But here, viability information turned out to be um, to be analog to the manual tripe and blue dye principle. And that is sort of logical because the optical density of cells that are alive is of course different than the surrounding media because there's a compartment, there's the cytoplasma in it. Um, when cells are dying, they form holes in the membrane. And that's the effect when tripe and blue can enter a cell. And here the surrounding media enters the cell and the, the, the cytoplasma and the, the compartments of the cells, um, they diffuse out. So the phase contrast is almost the same than the liquid, but definitely different from viable cells. And that's what uh, those technologies use to discriminate between viable and dead cells. So this is uh, the, the actual system working in the lab. And as you can see here, this is the holographic um, part of the, um, of the hardware. And then there is a line going into the bioreactor to get the sample out. But the fact that we are not, that it is not necessary to use tripe and blue allows this principle to bring the cell sample back into the bioreactor after the hologram has been, has been generated. And that, of course, puts the, the samples back in the bioreactor and you don't lose any sample volume. So that's the, as I view it, the main advantage of this technology and of course the fact that the results you get is the results are here, the dots, the results are in line with manual cell counting or um, the, the, the technologies that are based on image recognition, uh, like here the CDEX system or the, the beckman coulter weissel system. And you get a big amount of data. Every half an hour, you are able to record one data point. And that is also true not only for the viability, but also for uh, the cell concentration. Here, another batch just to prove that this is true. So results are equivalent. You can measure online without lo losing sample volume, and you are able to refocus after um, after the image is taken. That's also something new I forgot to to mention. Uh, with an image that is not sharp, 
you have no chance to uh, to 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 fo get it in focus again. But while you get a three-dimensional information and face contrast about your cells, it is possible to refocus and go through different focus lines based on the information of the hologram when the sample is long gone. And that's something I guess also the FDA and EMEA will definitely like. And now, and that's my last point uh, here, I want to uh, move to something completely different where we tried at the University of Bielefeld to, um, to use a robot, a robotic system that does not need a special space. So if we see also here pipetters, they are in, in a little hood due to sterility reasons. We may see robots working um, also in a cabinet, um, but that is also, uh, of course, that is also for, for safety reasons. And you need dedicated areas, dedicated points and positions where you have certain objects like pipettes, sample cups, um, liquids, the cell culture, or whatever. Um, and they have to be very, very precisely determined. And we had the idea to automate the lab work without that, with the robot using the same instruments, the same disposables as we do as human beings in the lab. So that would mean that the robot needs to find a centrifuge, even if it's moved by half a meter. It has to find a rack of sample cups on the lab bench, even if it has moved about 10, 15, 20 centimeters. And that's you know, wh what we try to do to automate the process of take, getting a sample out of a bioreactor, then pipetting it into a sample cup that is used for cell counting, then centrifuge the, the sample, um, pipette aliquots into barcoded sample tubes to freeze samples for further analysis, you know, for example, antibody concentration, whatever, um, or for documentation purposes, and to use aliquots for the different analytes using different analyzers. So the robot should move in the lab, avoid, of course, some the bioreactors or something that is in its way, and should also avoid human beings. So this is the lab, and as you can see, it's uh, pretty much a standard lab. Maybe uh, yeah, some some of them in some of your, the labs you know there is not so much equipment standing around, but this is really the environment where this robot should move uh, and share the same space and the same instruments. And this is what we came up with, a robot here on wheels, three wheels um, for orientation. There are um, cameras, one uh, color camera and one black and white camera uh, on the gripper here. The gripper has a torque sensor to, to be able to, to grasp something. And then we have uh, two uh, laser scanning devices on the back and the front of the of the robot, um, yeah, to to see whether there's something something in the way or not. Uh, the orientation or the navigation was tested in a corridor first. So we have here the the origin. Then we have known marks. So we we put some reflector bars um, on the walls um, and told the the robot to move a little bit. So we have the current position and then the target position. And this is what the robot actually sees. So this is the, the result of the laser scanning procedure. And here you see the walls. There are position marks that are recognized. So the robot knows by recognizing those marks where, where it is. And <coughs> there is a person standing behind the robot because these are the two legs. The, the laser scanner scans in a height of 20 up to 30 centimeters. And this is, you know, how the robot views us as people, only the two legs. But that's enough to, uh, to move then in, uh, in a different direction. And I will show you um, a short movie, um, about three, three minutes, ten or something like that. And in the movie there will be, uh, the, the speaker will um, uh, refer to some some marks that are on the centrifuge on fuge on the rack of um, uh, of sample cups, for example, uh, and these marks are the yellow squares that you will see in the movie, 
um, with additional blue, little blue and red marks. And this, the blue and red marks, that's a code for the instrument or the, 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 the sample cup rack that uh, the, the robot is standing in front of. Um, and the, the mark, the orientation of the mark, also determines the orientation of the centrifuge, for example. Uh, because that is the zero point, this marks determine the zero position and the coordinates of the centrifuge and its orientation in the room. Okay, so I try to start this now because sometimes it's... That's the, ah, over there, okay. Okay, so here, just uh, uh, for uh, orientation purposes, we have a 20 liter bioreactor in the lab, a 100 liter bioreactor. This is the fridge. Uh, this is the centrifuge the, the robot will use, and the cell counter and the pipetting station. Um, and I will show the task of getting a sample out of the bioreactor, then getting a sample uh, cells into the, the sample cup, going to the cell counter, um, and then opening the centrifuge um, with the centrifugated. So I, I skipped the part of putting the, the sample into the centrifuge, so get the, the part out and freeze it. Okay, so that's hopefully what is coming next. screen. Let's see. Uh, no, we can do we can do differently. Uh, if you have if you have the uh, the file uh, here I can I can hear it is no we can we can, oh we can go there yeah. and that's this, this one, one huh? okay That's in, that's interesting. Yeah, but Does that work? Uh, it worked in the morning, I promise. Yes, I was there. Yeah, but let's see, something is something is moving here. That's strange. Let me check. Uh, really interesting. Yeah, but it's still still loading. I will the following sampling ah, procedure okay. is just an example sequence. It can be modified at any time for performing other tasks in different laboratory setups. Fine positioning is also achieved through the marker. Distance and orientation of the object in relation to the marker is known. Therefore, an object can be safely grasped upon completion of the fine positioning routine. All operations are under the control of the force torque sensor. The gripper moves down until it touches the upper rim of the rack. Once contact is made at the estimated height, the manipulation continues. The vial, which is covered with a septum, is put into the holding rack of the sampling device. The sampling station is connected to the bioreactor via an aseptic pneumatic sampling valve, which is inserted into a standard adapter in the bioreactor jacket. Two more pneumatic valves control the culture broth flow. After discarding the first part of the fluid, the rest of the sample is taken aseptically and aerosol free. The septum seals the vial tightly after sampling. The tubes are flushed with condensate and are steam sterilized after taking the sample. The sampling device is then prepared for the next cycle. After taking the cell counter vial from the storage rack, it is positioned underneath the needle. The sample is dispensed into it and the vial is moved to the cell counter.
The sample is inserted into the carousel of the automatic sampler. To prevent the container from being inserted incorrectly, its position is verified by the gripper once again. The principle of measurement is the tripe and blue die exclusion method. The automatic evaluation by image processing achieves a much higher statistical significance of the result than a manual count. The robot now opens the sliding door of the freezer to prepare the storage of the cell-free supernatant. Force torque control is particularly important here to prevent the door from getting stuck. The next task is to remove the sample vial with the separated cells from the centrifuge. Since the rotor does not stop at a specific angle, the robot has to turn it into a position from which it is possible to grasp the vial. In the meantime, the pipetting device was flat. Okay, so that was uh, a, a short movie. Um, the full length is about 20 minutes or so, and then the, the robot has completed um, all the tasks and gets back to the charging station because uh, it, uh, in the end of the day, it needs energy. Um, so this is a totally different concept, a different principle, and I just wanted to um, to show this to, to the public because the project um, ended eight years ago um, and the machine was then uh, taken by Bayer to Berkeley. Uh, I know that it worked there for another four to five years and I simply don't know if it is still working there. So it's a machine that um, is not only a concept but it's, it's really doing its job Unfortunately, there was no further investment by the state, for example, because that was also funded by the German state. There was no further investment to really make a product out of it. And that's something where I think um, automation is lacking these days. We have uh, in, the, in the fundamental uh, development and research, we have a lot of ideas, but we need to make products out of these ideas, I guess, I think. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Um, I would like to know, uh, thank you for this uh, very nice approach. I think totally smashing, even if this is something old, let's say, because it was 80 years ago, 18, sorry. So I would like to know if you have a, a question here in the audience. Um, yeah? Jakub Świecz from ITOS Therapeutics. I have a question concerning your robot. I know it was year, eight years ago, but if you would at this time compare the speed of work of the same task made by human versus the speed that robot was doing. Of course, for me, robot requires a little bit more time, but what would be the comparison, how much faster or slower the robot was? So I would, I would think it's uh, about, the robot needs five times longer than a human being or even more. The only benefit is that it is able to work 24 hours in the lab. And as you mentioned, it's eight years ago, so the robots look different now. There are two armed robots now that can, can take pipettes and whatever. So uh, I, I think uh, time is, is now ready you know, for such a product, I guess, because everything is faster and quicker. Is there another? No. Another question in the audience? Yeah, just, just a question about the time necessary to, pro to program the system. You need, for example, 10 days to program a five-minute experiment, or the ratio is not like that? Yeah, th that's a good question, because as th this was uh, a prototype, and everything was built from the scratch, it took uh, three 
people um, more than four years to program what you just saw. But of course, there is uh, there is there are fundamental things uh, like uh, like the scanning device, uh, the the laser scanner, and to to read out the data and to to program certain actions. Once you have those actions, avoid an object, for example, was one routine that was very important, of course. Then the other, take a sample out of the bioreactor, grasp. Uh, uh, sa um, sampling vial. Uh, once you have this, you can you can like it is done uh, in other automation concepts. You can use those routines uh, and put them together. Add new ones, of course. For example, if you are if you want the robot to use a different type of centrifuge, you have to reprogram that program for this for this centrifuge as you have to do for any other automation. Uh, if you add an analyzer or a div another system. So, but the basic functionality is working. Thank you very much. I think this is a subject that we can continue during the workshop or another meeting with Elric because that's a totally different approach. So four years to program a robot, I think that now with the evolution of the technology and things, it could be lower than that. But uh, what, uh, what is great in that concept is that you have the Aziz situation and then you put something in and you use all the instruments that you have already in your lab. Thank you very much, Professor. So, thank you. <laughs>